to my lecture. Um, I'm honored to speak about this topic, using genealogy research to reconnect Holocaust survivors and their families with their past and their family history. This is a subject that I'm very passionate about. It's been a passion project of mine for quite some time. Um, just as a background on me, um, I am an educator at the museum and I am a genealogist as well. I've been doing genealogy research for um, over 10 years. And when I started working at the museum, I started working closely with Holocaust survivors and it occurred to me that I can use my skills as a genealogist to help Holocaust survivors reconnect with, with their past as unfortunately so many are missing those links. And what started this um, project actually was a survivor in our community. His name is Dave Lux. Unfortunately, he passed away about two years ago. And in talking to him, he said that he only had one thing that connected him with his parents, that essentially the only thing that even proved his parents ever existed. Dave Lux left um, Czechoslovakia on a kinder transport and this ID card of his, if you could please show the ID card. He said, this is the only thing that he had that connected him to his parents because it has their names on it. That's it, which is honestly the only reason he really knew their names. As you can see, he was about um, you know five, six years old when he last saw them. <laughs> Um, and so that gave me the idea that I can use my skills as a genealogy researcher to help survivors get something else, even if it's something small, that something, just anything to connect them with their parents or grandparents. So this is how my, the idea for my project started. Now, in terms of genealogy research, um, this goes for anyone. The question is always, where do we start? Well, the good news is that genealogy research is only getting easier. I started this about 13 years ago. Even in that span, it is exponentially easier to do genealogy research because so many records are being digitized and put online at really a rapid rate, and it makes it really convenient for us. So uh, the, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind about genealogy is that it's a never ending puzzle. You're just never gonna be able to complete your genealogy. There are always gonna be blanks. That being said, for families who um, have been affected by the Shoah, it, there unfortunately are gonna be some more blanks because uh, there are more and more people who you know, lost the opportunity to ask certain questions. Um, and there's just a lot more missing. For example, there don't tend to be a lot of death records for those who actually perished in this show, but that's a subject we'll visit a little bit later. So what are the things we start with? Um, birth, marriage, and death records, which are called vital records. This is something, um, this is really what genealogy research it's a big part of it because these records include basic information like um, parents' names and mother's maiden name. So uh, um, what these records are, are kept in different national archives across Europe. Um, and uh, what we can do, I'll show you what they look like. So if we show photos two and three, for the most part, a lot of records like these in Europe were kept in This is another form of vital record. And it, what, what these are, these are just different styles of record keeping. And um, they basically are re records of what I said, birth, marriages, and deaths. And you know you can read these thoroughly, which we don't really have time to get into the specifics of them. But um, and you can go ahead and show 
five and six. For the you know the sake of time, we I'm and I'm also trying as best I can to go through as many countries as possible. Um, oh, sorry, not not quite that one. Um, number five. Um, I'm showing some different examples of what vital records look like um, throughout. Let's see. Well, it's okay. What we can do, you know, we we can we can skip some of the next photos. What I'm going to show you now is how we can search for them. So this image on the right um, is a record from Poland. And again, um, I also want to. Um, like to just say we're still relatively new at this, so please bear with us if we have any technical problems. We're um, we're 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 all still learning some of this technology. So what I'm going to do is show you some of the websites that you can find these because, like I said, these documents are kept in archives, but these archives across Europe have been scanning them at a really um, rapid rate and putting them online. Now, how do we view these? There is a website called Jewish Gen that I'm going to show you. This is the leading Jewish genealogy website. Um, I'm going to. OK, I'm going to share Jewish Gen right now. Yes. And let's see, I hope this is working. Okay. Okay. This is jewishgen.org. Like, um, like I said, the leading Jewish genealogy website out there for anybody interested in researching their, um, their family history. Now, uh, this is a completely free website where volunteers have worked to put millions of records online. And just for, I'm going to give you a run through of how we can use this to find a, one of these records that I was talking about. So uh, this is, comes from survivors in our community, um, three sisters who survived the Holocaust together. Their names are Sally Marco, who unfortunately passed away, Ruth Miller and Regina Hirsch. Um, they, their parents and a lot of other, their siblings perished in the Shoah, but and they didn't have anything to connect them with their parents. So I wanted to find them a birth record um, for, their, for their parents. Um, so they knew that their mother was from a town called Hrubyeshov, which if you see that, I clicked on this link here, um, Jewish Communities Database, and I already typed it in here. Now this is the town because again, these small towns, you need to know where exactly you can find these records. So this is a town and it shows you where it was. And it says it's near Lublin. Lublin is the biggest city now nearby. So we go back to the home page. On top of this, I'm also navigating my new computer. Um, so now we can search. Now their mother's maiden name was Koenig. So that's where you can type it in. I met some, oh, sorry. Matter of fact, um, now this is JRI Poland connected with Jewish Gen, um, and this is a database where you can search a lot of Polish records. But the reason that I I showed you earlier how I um, that where I looked up the town, it's because we need to know what province to look for now. What this is going to do is show us, if we click on Lublin, again, this is a website completely done, but with the help of volunteers throughout the years. And these are all the small towns around Lublin with, um, with anyone with a name that sounds close enough to Koenig. Now, again, I mentioned they were that their mother was born in Hrubyeshov. And this is now who, records from Hrubyeshov. Um, and I was looking to see if I could find their mother's birth record. And I, this, is, this looks like her, their, that was her name. This is a version of Esther. And it's been scanned. So what you can do is you can click on that tab over there.
and it takes you right to the Polish State Archives website. Again, by the way, I want to, um, as we're waiting for this to load, I want to just bring to your attention that even 10 years ago, the, these images from the Polish State Archives was not linked here yet. And you look, no, this is written in Russian because this is part of the Russian part, uh, Russian, Russian Poland, and this is 1890, the 1890s. So this part of Poland was under the Russian Empire, and this is a record in Russian, and here it is. And you can see if you read in Russian, it gives you her exact birth date, which again, they didn't know because they last saw their mother when they were teenagers. They had no idea what her birth date was. And this actually gives her birth date, both of her parents' names, her mother's maiden name, which you can see here. It's Nukem Koenig and Isla Friedenthal. And if you, you can even zoom in here and you can see that her father, their grandfather, signed the bottom of the record right here. So now, um, even though this is a copy, they have a record of their mother's birth with an image of their grandfather's signature. And this is something um, that is really meaningful for a lot of survivors to have because it's also, it's learning new information. You can't, you know, there, for so many years, they haven't been able to learn anything about their parents. And now, thanks to genealogy research, this is something they're able to, to do. Um, I'm gonna go back to this website. I mentioned JRI Poland, which again, um, this is, you know, this is, very important for anyone doing Polish research uh, because this extracts all the records from Polish archives on here and it's free. Anybody can use it for free. So that was their mother's birth record. And now I wanted to see if I could find anything about their father. They lived in the city of Lodz and this their maiden name was Landowicz. And I know that Lodz um, is in the Piotrkov Gubernia. Gubernia is like a province. I, I'm sorry, it was not sharing that properly. Okay. Again, I'm, I apologize for I my technical difficulties. So this is, again, like I said, their maiden name was Landovich, and this is now, uh, I'm checking the city of Lodz for all these years for anybody with that name. And I found this is their parents' marriage record. 1917, their father, Isaac Janko Landovich, married their mother, Esther Jofbet Koenig. Um, and this is not linked to the Polish state archives. So, what you do is, in this case, you can write directly to the Polish State Archives in Lodz, um, but this makes it easier. Again, thanks to the volunteers who put this online, we have it right here. It's all you have to do is you can contact the archives in, Lodz, in the city of Lodz and say you'd like a scan of this marriage record, um, but you have the number here. This is the document number in the year, and that makes it really easy for them to show it. Now, um, if we could please share photo number eight. Um, let's see, it's not that one, that might be, it is, Yes, uh, well, no, sorry, it's, um, so what I what I did is I, I'm writing to the Polish State Archives and getting that record, um, it gave them their parents' marriage record that had both of their parents' signatures on it, which was really nice for them to have, and it's um, hard to see when you zoom in, but it's, um, what, what it is, is that it gives them something now, it, it's, again, first of all, they're that have their parents' anniversary on it, which is nice because it's not something I had previously had before. Um, 
And then to get to look at their parents' signatures was not only nice for them, but also for their, you know, their, who would have been their kids. Their, their children didn't, who never got to meet their grandparents can now see their parents' signatures. So that's a brief demo about how to find some vital records. There it is. And if you go, if you see on the bottom left, that's where their signatures are. Um, now, again, that's a very brief, um, very brief introduction to finding vital records from Poland. Again, this is largely possible and easy for the public to do. Um, thanks to these two websites, Jewish Gen and JRI Poland, which works together with Jewish Gen. If we could please show photo number nine, the large family photo. Okay, this is a family photo of Renee Firestone's family. For those of you who don't know Renee Firestone, she's a survivor in our community. She's been sharing her story with many institutions for years. Um, this is a very rare thing for a Holocaust survivor to have because unfortunately, part of the loss was losing anything that these families had owned before the Holocaust, such as photos. Now, the reason that Renee Firestone has this photo is because she had relatives who had left Europe before the war and they had sent these photos abroad. And fortunately, after Renee survived, she was able to retrieve these photos. Um, for the most part, though, a lot of survivors are very lacking in terms of um, family photos from before the Holocaust. Now, one of the survivors in our community, Miriam Bell, unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but she gave me this idea because she told me a story that the last time she had a family photo, her mother asked her to bring it from one end of the ghetto to the other end. She lived in Kovno, Kalanis, Lithuania. And her mother asked her to bring this framed family photo to another part of the ghetto where her older sister lived. And on the way, sold German soldiers took it and they threw the photo away and they sent Miriam to a camp and she never saw her parents or her mother again, her father had perished earlier. And um, she told that story because it's the last time she ever had a family photo. Now, I thought to myself, I wonder if there is any way to, if any of these archives in Europe have photos of people. Before I get into this part of my talk, I want to just preface it by saying the, the answer is it's very rare, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. What I did was I did some research and I found out that in Lithuania before the war, where and Miriam lived in Lithuania, um, they had ID cards. Anybody over the age of 17 needed to have a state issued ID card. And if we could please show photo number 10, the single Lithuanian internal passport. Yes, so this is what a Lithuanian ID card looks like. Now it's called an internal passport for all intents and purposes. Basically, this is a state issued ID card from Lithuania that was required for everybody over the age of 17. What I found out, and this is Lithuania is an exception, which is why I like talking about it because it's, I wish this was a case with more countries. Unfortunately, it's just not. But in Lithuania, um, they have about 150,000 of these in the archives from that were between the years of 1919 and 1941. Now, um, that being said, what you, um, Jewish Gen, the website I mentioned earlier, you can actually has an index of these uh, documents. So uh, I'm gonna show you Jewish Gen again. Okay, I'm sharing Jewish Gen. Um, okay, so Miriam's maiden name was Galperin, and 
this is a collection right here. If you type in her name, you can see Lithuania Internal Passports Database, and they have 372 Galperins. And you see over here, anybody with the last name Galperin, it shows you where that they have passport cards on files. And eventually, um, you can keep looking through through these and see if if you see the person you're looking for. And this now this was a few years ago. Let's see if okay, well it might have been on, but I want to show you how. Okay, it might have been page four. If I can't find it right away, it's not that important. Um, so I eventually found her family in here, and if I can, okay, maybe it was, um, should have, should have looked for this before I, I started. Well, in any case, I found Miriam's, um, family in here with a passport card number. I found her two parents and her two older siblings, but what it said is, again, these don't have images attached to them. This is just, um an index that volunteers did, and it tells you where they are. So I wrote to the archives in Kaunas, Lithuania, and I gave them the numbers that were fortunately on, you know, listed online, the, um, the exact document number, and I said, I'm looking for these, can you send them to me? And within like two weeks, I actually got a response from them, and they said, yes, we have them on file. And again, the important part to keep in mind is that these ID cards have photos, so, if we could please show the photos of Miriam's parents, photo 11. And they sent them to me. And this is the first time Miriam saw her parents in about 70 years, because fortunately they were over the age of 17, obviously, and they had their ID cards on file still. Like I said, um, there were about 150,000 of these that exist for Lithuanian Jews. Um, and there were, a, I, Lithuania had a population of about 160,000 Jews um, before the war. So theoretically, I thought, well, most of Lithuanian Jews should have internal passports on file. And it does differ by city, but Kavno, where Miriam lived, that actually is where, um, that has a really big, big number on file. And if we could please show photo number 12, her siblings. And these are her older siblings as well. I, Miriam was the fourth of seven children. So her, at, this, at the point, 1941, when Germany invaded Lithuania, um, which was part of the Soviet Union at that time, only her two oldest siblings were over the age of 17. So the rest of her siblings were not here. The two of them actually survived. And if we could please show photo 13 of Miriam with her siblings. And now their kids got to see what their parents look like a little bit younger because until then, Miriam's um, nieces and nephews, they had all this picture they had seen of their parents were, you know, right after the war. And of course they had never seen photos of their grandparents. And if we could show number 14, please, Miriam with her mother. Miriam's family also got to see how much she resembled her mother, which they had obviously never had any, any way of knowing before this. And this is a unique example of how ID cards that are still on file can help provide photos of victims. Now, unfortunately, I can't stress this enough when I say that Lithuania is a very rare exception because these photos are rare. That being the case, it's this is a relatively under-researched subject. Most genealogy researchers are looking for records, and so photos have not really, these sorts of things haven't really come to the minds of many researchers yet which is why when I have contacted archives across Europe and asked them about this, sometimes the answer has been, 
yes, we have a lot of ID cards on file, but you know, none of them are indexed and it's not really our priority. Our priority, we do vital records and you know, we have a couple of ID card applications on file, but it's it's just not something for the most part that has really been researched. But that's why I like to talk about it because it makes such a difference for survivors and their family to be able to have photos. Um, and it's something that to, from an archival perspective, it might not be the most, or a genealogical perspective, I should say, it might not be the most important thing, but in the context of doing this for Holocaust survivors and their families, this is really crucial because again, now in this case, Miriam got to see her parents' faces again. Um, I'm gonna move on to Poland. And if we could show photo number 15, please, the Polish ID card. Unfortunately, ID cards in Poland were not mandated before the war. They were not required. So um, there are a lot fewer in Poland. You only needed a couple of, um, only for a few reasons did you really need an ID card. This one I would like to show was um, actually from the museum's archive. Um, and what it is, is this shows you, you know, somebody who had an ID card in Poland. It's only, again, for specific reasons, if you want to open a business or take out a loan. But day to day, it's unlike Lithuania, most people did not have one, which is why they didn't exist for everybody. If we could please show photo number 16, the Ken Carta. So when Nazi Germany invaded Poland, they um, they mandated that any form of existing identification card was obsolete, and you needed one official an official Third Reich identification card, known as a Kenkarte. This one comes from the museum archives as well, actually. Um, and I like to point out, you can it's probably a little hard to see here on a Facebook screen, but it says this Ken Carta is set to expire in 1947. Well, fortunately, Nazi Germany did not last that long. But um, this shows you that theoretically, anybody living under the Third Reich was supposed to have one of these. The reality with the final solution, though, Nazi Germany did not have time to mandate every single citizen living under their territory um, would have one. Nonetheless, if we could please show number 17, photo 17. There were different forms of ghetto ID, card, of ID cards as well, including this one called an Ausweis. This is an ID card issued in a ghetto. This is the Radom ghetto. Different ghettos did um, had these, and for example, if you're supposed to, if you to work in a ghetto, you needed to have a Ken card. I mean, a excuse me, a ghetto, an Ausweis, an ID card, and it just depends. Um, and this, what it looks like, you can see the yellow star of David on the front. If you could please show photo number eighteen. What um, this is a. Um, oh, uh, it's it's the the color one. Um, well, I'll show. It. So uh, different ghettos. What you needed to do to get an Ausweis, an ID card in the ghetto? Yes, the, the, that one. I, I actually, the reason I wanted to show this one, um, this is for Ralph Hackman, um, and he's unfortunately he passed away. A survivor in our community. He just passed away about two weeks ago. This is his application for an Ausweis in the Radom ghetto, and so I just wanted to show that. Now, um, there are ways to search through some of these because a lot of these have been put online. And I know I've been showing you a lot of search engines. USHMM, the museum in DC has one of these, um, but, and as well as Jewish Gen, you can search these on different forms. I am going to share right now my screen, if I can try. Okay. Okay. 
This is Ancestry.com. Another, there are several genealogy websites. This is actually a paid subscription, um, but this is a collection that comes from USHMM. Again, the museum in DC indexed some of the ID cards from the Lodge Ghetto in Poland. Now, what you can do, there are other ways to search through these, but I'm just using this for the sake of this presentation. Um, this is the easiest one to demonstrate. So a survivor in our community who serves on our board of directors, his name is David Wiener, and he was born in Lodge, and his um, he had, came from a big family, and it occurred to me that his siblings probably got ID cards in the ghetto. His parents were in their 60s at this time, but what I did is uh, type in his name. This is the Polish spelling, so that's his name there. And you know, their father was Moshe Chaim. So let's see any one of Moshe Chaim Wiener's children. And I'll show you. OK, these are two of his brothers. Now, you can also see their birth dates, which indicates the age that um, you know somebody is deemed fit for work in a ghetto. Um, these are younger people, to, you know, generally, even, even in their 30s. It's, was con the vast majority of people who had these worker ID cards um, were this age. Now, what it is is that um, this they do not have uh, images linked to here. You have to go through the Polish State Archives website, and the Polish State Archives does not really prioritize these. Like I said, if we could please show. Photo 19, the application for an ID card that's black, that one, yes. So this is what one of David Wiener's brother's applications looked like for an ID card. You can't even see the photo. Um, and again, it's just, this is the way, you know, they're doing it, they're, the text in this case is more important to, to the archival staff because this is a historical document. When they're scanning these, they're not considering maybe this is the only photo that a survivor will ever have of one of their family members. That's that, that's not on their minds. Um, so uh, if you, I mean, you can't even see that photo. Now, what I did is I wrote to them and I got the idea. I and I hoped this was the case. I hoped that you know it was just a bad scan. I wrote to them and I said, "Can you please send me a color scan of of this document?" Again, it was. I had all the information. I had the document number, thanks to the fact that that's all been put online. If you can please show photo number 20, the color version of this. And that color scan made a huge difference because now you can actually see his brother's face. And fortunately, because of this, David now had photo. He previously had no family photos. He now had photos of two of his brothers and his brother-in-law. And um, the Lodge Ghetto has a large collection of these ID cards because it, one of the reasons it actually was a longest standing ghetto, you know, was, wasn't liquidated until summer of 1944. Um, and there are about 8,000 of these with photos. Um, and if you can please show photo number 21, Jack Lewin and his mother. I like showing this photo um, because this is a survivor in our community, Jack Lewin, whose mother had an ID card and like, he had no family photos. And I was able to find this photo of his mother for him. Only photo he has of his mother, he cherishes it. Um, but this was such a, I like sharing this case because it was so rare. His mother was born in 1897 and I actually did the math. I looked at this statistically 1% of the people who had ID cards in the Lodge ghetto were her age. Again, deemed, you know, fit for work as she was in her forties. That's considered even old for that standard. That was so rare, and we were so lucky that she had an ID card in the ghetto because now he has a photo of his mother. Um, that's, I like talking about photos because even though I mentioned it's, that they're, it's rare, this is a rare thing to find, um, it's a good example of how you can be creative with your research. 
you can think about things that even if others haven't really done any work in that on that certain topic, you never know what's out there in an archive that has just not been prioritized. So it's always works to be creative because you can always find something um, if you know you just give it that information. Now I'm going to share with you switching gears the Arlson archives. Okay. This is a relatively new website here. These are archives from Germany. Um, as we know, Germany, the Germ uh, people say the Germans were meticulous record keepers, which is true. Unfortunately, as they were leaving the war, uh, losing the war, they tried to destroy a lot of evidence, but um, there's still a lot of records that survived. For example, 80% of records from Auschwitz did not survive. Um, so, but even so, the remaining 20% of records for anyone who was ever in Auschwitz, 20% is actually still a very large number, even if it's not, you know, not most of them. This is a website you can use uh, to look for, um, for records on inmates, both during the Holocaust and right after. Um, it's just arlson-archives.org. It's completely free. And uh, what you can do is, uh, this is, um, the thing I, that's important to share about this is that they're constantly adding more scans to this. Um, so you all, if you, if you try to look for one of your family members and you don't find them, check back in a few months because some, you know, they're always adding things onto this. I'm going to show you an example of some records that exist on the Arlson Archives website. This is David Langa, a survivor in our community who I believe is watching this. And it shows you all the matches we have for David Langa. This is him. And this is a, a card from Dachau. Um, this is a post-war card that I'll show in a little bit. Okay. There's, okay, this is what I was looking for. It can be, sometimes it doesn't specify which one. He was in Dachau, and this is a registration form of his from Dachau. And it's pretty easy to navigate. Um, but you see here this record of his, and I'll show you. This gives his first and last name, his birth date, which, by the way, he when I showed this to him, he said it was a. Um, I'll show you this in a second. It says where he's from, and of course, this is all in German. Litzmannstadt is uh, the German spelling for, uh, or the German what the Germans renamed the city of Lodz in Poland. Um, and uh, it says his occupation, he was a tailor. He gives both of his parents' names, Abraham and Sarah, his mother's maiden name. And this is information that he gave when he was registering himself. And it says over here, um, his, in German, it says, I basically, what you would say when you sign any legal document, except for the part where it says under penalty of death, I, um, you know, um, this says he signed it right here that this is information he gave them is all true and when i remember when i first showed this to david he said it was amazing that he lied on it because he was born in 1927 and he made himself look a little bit older probably to give himself a better chance of survival fortunately david survived and he speaks at our museum and he will be giving digital talks as well and again i believe he's listening to this so. um Thank you, David, for allowing me to share that. And another sort of document that exists as well, uh, David's father survived. And these are some documents that exist about what survivors did after the war, where they wanted to go. Um, this shows his father here and it, um, it's like a seven page document 
with a photo. Again, this is right after, just after the war. And oh, this is something I, I wanted to share. This, this one question, you probably can't read it on the Facebook screen. One of the questions is, it says, future plans. Do you wish to return to your country of former residence? David's father wrote, no. And then, if not, why? And the answer was, it has no relatives there. And his desired destination, what he wanted to go to Israel. This is um, 1949. Now, one more database i'm going to show you the final one again there are many more i'm just giving you a brief overview of what to look for and most importantly what kinds of questions you need to ask um you know so this is i'm sure most of you are familiar with yad vashem this is the world the leading holocaust institute in israel this um founded in 1953 it's museum, but it's also an institute. And from really the time of its inception in the early 1950s, Yad Vashem has constantly made it their goal to find as many details about victims of the Holocaust as possible. And this database here, these are called pages of testimony, where I'll show you an example in a minute, but survivors after the Holocaust submitted what's called a page of testimony where they had anybody, um, you know, any or relatives who they wanted to remember, they submitted um, information about them with their, you know, first and last name, um, their parents' names, any other information. And you can search that entire database here. I'm gonna go to advanced search and you can search a page of testimony for a victim. Again, these are all secondhand because they're submitted by survivors after the Holocaust. And a lot of cases, um, you know, they, a lot of them, they, um, they might be inferring a cause of death because, you know, in certain cases for cause of death, they'll just write the last place they saw them. And I hope this can load. Let's see, my internet's slowing down a little bit. Um, it looks like we're, we might be having a little bit of problems with the Yad Vashem website. Well, what I, you know, what I'll, okay, let's see if this works. This is a great resource to find information about victims that a survivor might have submitted. And um, I don't know if I can get this to load. So I'll tell you what the way I use this. Um, so we have survivors in our, in our community, some of the younger ones, uh, um, Louise Lerner, who I also believe is listening to this lecture, um, is, uh, her parents survived, but they never talked about what happened um, because it was too painful for them. And so as a result, she, she Louise herself was born in 1938. She did not um, know anything about her grandparents, nothing. And so what I did is I checked Yad Vashem's website to see if... Um, if her parents had submitted any information after the Holocaust about their parents. And it turned out, unfortunately, um, oh, that's, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't, the Yad Vashem website's not loading. Um, so we can put the camera back on me. So what happened is um, her parents had both submitted pages of testimonies for their parents. And as a result of that, those are all available online. And from those, Louise was, first of all, able to learn her grandparents' names, which she didn't know, um, and information about them, where they lived, where they were born. And then based on that, we just went through Jewish Gen, the first website I showed you, and 
Louise previously, she only knew her parents' names, no, nothing about her grandparents. And now, th thanks to that information that her parents had submitted after the war, they had learned about, um, she, we were able to, tr to trace her grandparents and some of her great grandparents and created a much more detailed family tree with birth dates and death dates. So I like bringing your attention to Yad Vashem as well, because it's even though it's submitted information submitted by survivors, um, it's a really great resource. Yad Vashem also has in their collections documents from all over Europe that they've been slowly adding to their database as well. If you could please show photo 22, the last one. This is a cemetery, the Jewish cemetery in Lodz, Poland. And I like concluding with this. Um, first of all, I, I consider myself an eccentric genealogist. And as such, I, I really like cemeteries. It's a genealogist thing. But there's something more important about this than, than that. I think it is so most survivors and their families have always been under the impression that nothing survived because we all are familiar with the images of headstones being toppled over, which of course happened. People are really surprised to learn just how many cemeteries actually still stand in Europe, including this one in Lodge. You can see they're really overgrown, but this is something, if you look at, um, if you look at the, you know, you can go to some of these cemeteries and actually see in this case, you know, let's say a survivor had a grandparent who died before the war, this, um, their headstones still exist in some cases. And while so many survivors and their families have never had a place to go and say Kaddish, this is a permanent marker that is still there for quite a few of these Jewish communities. And of course, we headstones with the Hebrew name, it'll give the father's first name. So it genealogically can help you. It has a death date. But I think these cemeteries and Jewish cemeteries that still stand in Europe are really a just a beautiful reminder that our footprint really of our culture, it's still there and there's still a lot that we can find and, and learn from it. At this point, I'm going to see if we have questions. Um, and Okay. The first question is, are there any other places or sites to look for lost family in Poland other than Jewish Gen and JRI Poland? My best recommendation is that those are the best places to start. Like I said, and I started in the beginning, I mentioned this, how on Jewish Gen, not everything is up there yet. That's the work of amazing and dedicated volunteers who at their own expense and time have been, have gone through the Polish state archives and indexed certain records and put them online. They have not gone through every single Polish archives, meaning, you know, there's only so much they can do um, at a time, even though they're constantly working on it. You can always contact an archivist, but instead of an archivist, I would suggest you can find a researcher in Poland who, um, you know, is familiar with archives. They can help you go in there and look for things that are not, that you can't find online. Go into the Polish state archives. It's, you know, not the easiest process, but it happens. Um, you know, you'd be surprised if you go, go through the archives just to see what they might have. Um, there, you know, there are things that, that are all, and also, um, the first example I showed you of those survivors the, for the three sisters from Lodge, their parents, whose birth record, whose birth, I found their mother's birth record. That birth record was not online when I first looked. I just checked again in a year and I found it there. You know, these volunteers are always adding more information online, which is why I say genealogy research is only getting easier. Um, the next question, where does a person begin if there is no trace of what happened to family members other than the city in Poland where they were born? That's a really good question. 
unfortunately, there are times when something is just not going to be documented and you might, you're not always going to find something. You're not always going to find answers, which is why I also started by saying genealogy research is like a never ending puzzle for families of the Shoah. You know, the puzzle is generally a little more complicated. You just might not find things sometimes. That being said, I, um, depending on, you know, on what their fate was, if these were people who went to camps, um, you might find records of them on the Arlson archives. I will say though, I forgot to mention this. If you go, if you were, when, let's say you're deported from a ghetto to Auschwitz, um, and if, if they killed you immediately, there's not gonna be a record of that because they didn't register prisoners who were, who were not selected to work. Um, so unfortunately that's the case with a lot of people and there, there just might not always be a record, but it, you can always find ways to look. Um, let's see, we have, if I know the names and relationships of some ancestors, for example, the names of my great grandfather's siblings, can I use that information to look forward to identify relatives currently alive? It depends if there are rel living relatives, you know, if these are relatives who, um, it, you know, if, if they left, I don't know if they left Europe, but there are ways, you know, if let's say they did or one of their kids left Europe, you can maybe find their, depending on when you can find an immigration record and then you can actually, depending on what country they went to, um, you might you might be able to. That's I mean it, that's very circumstantial. It just depends. Um, it's it's a possibility. I, I would have to honestly look into that a little bit closer and in, into the details of that. Is there a way to get the records the Germans kept about my father who was taken from Hungary to Bergen Belsen and died there? Um. Bergen-Belsen, there are some records from Bergen-Belsen. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how many of those are scanned onto the Arlson Archives website. It's a chance um, I can take a look. This question was actually asked by Erica Fabian, a survivor in our community who just spoke at the at, did our virtual talk on Sunday. I will look into this for you and see. Um, I hope we can find something. Um, so that, that could be, it just depends on when he was taken there and uh, how long he was there. Did small shtetls, shtetlech, have documents? And if so, where to look for them? Krubyeshov, the first city I showed you was not a very big place. It's not a shtetl, but you'd be surprised. And I like to actually, that's a really good question. I like to point this out. Um, people might be under the impression that, let's say, oh, my family came from a really small town, nothing exists. I have my great, great grandmother's birth record from a Sobkov. It's a very small town in Poland. I doubt anybody's heard of it. And I like to point that out, which, because the Polish State Archives has also scanned it. It's online. I found it online. Yes, um, small towns do actually have records that are available. Generally, smaller towns, um, let's say the parents would go and register the birth if it's a birth record or a marriage record. In the nearest big, um, bigger town or city, um, but again, it, those records are available sometimes. It's not all the time. Um, some smaller towns, I know the records have not survived, but this is an example of something that I like to you to keep in mind. Always look. You will you will be surprised if because you chances are you can find something. Um, and yes, there are plenty of records from small towns. Um, let's see. One question from one of our docents is some website for the people from Nicholas Ukraine. I would have to look into that specifically again. This availability of records does go place to place. Um, even if the records exist, the next question that's most convenient for us from our homes is, 
Is it available online? You know, even if it's not available online, you can always, if you go directly through the archive, which might take a, a little while, um, it's, you know, it can be, it can be a harder process, but it, um, and uh, unfortunately right now, archives are closed for the time being and we don't know when they'll open again. But in general, um, you can all, you know, you just need to go from place to place and archive to archive to really know what's available. But again, like I always like to say, there's more available out there than you think. What is the best way to locate family members who left for countries in South America prior or at the start of the war? That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm really familiar with American records. There are records that do exist. It depends on the country. Um, I know there's not, just from what I've seen, a whole lot on um, South America that's, you know, readily available online. There are, it does exist though. And for certain countries, you just, you want to consult an expert on that country um, because, uh, you know, if it's especially like I'm mentioning archives, somebody who knows the archive, who knows how to go through it, who knows, uh, um, you know, what to look for. And it just depends. Um, so personally, you know, I'm a lot more familiar with the United States and tracking immigrants who went to the United States. But um, these other countries, they, they things still exist. There's information that you can find about them. Um, let's see. Believe that is all of the questions. I would like to um, thank you all for your attention and remind you if you have any other questions, you're welcome to email me. You can either contact the museum directly through our Facebook page or my email, Michael, M I C H A E L, at L A M O T H dot O R G. Um, you can go onto our website, lamoth.org, and you can con you can find my email address there as well. Um, and I, you know, I do want to thank you for for your attention. And before we sign off, um, I want to let you know that while the museum is closed, we will be regularly providing compelling virtual programs like this one. Please follow this Facebook page and visit our website, again, lamoth.org, for the most up-to-date information about our programs. And thank you for joining us. We wish everyone a happy Passover and Easter. Thank you very much.